I'm glad that we can gather even if it's online. I wanted to share uh, Psalm 66 with you. We're going to read um, together and feel free to read it out loud. I know it can feel kind of funny in the, in the privacy of your own home, but the good news is nobody really cares what you sound like. It's just your family, right? Or your roommates. So let's read this together. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Give to him glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies come cringing to you. All the earth worships you and sings praises to you. They sing praises to your name. Come and see what God has done. He is awesome in his deeds toward the children of man. He turned the sea into dry land. They passed through the river on foot. There did we rejoice in him, who rules by his might forever, whose eyes keep watch on the nations. Let not the rebellious exalt themselves. We're in verse 8. Bless our God, O peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard, who has kept our soul among the living and has not let our feet slip. For you, O God, have tested us. You have tried us as silver is tried. You brought us into the net. You laid a crushing burden on our backs. You let men ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water. Yet you have brought us out to a place of abundance. Let's go over to verse 16. Come and hear all you who fear God, and I will tell what he has done for my soul. I cried to him with my mouth, and high praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But truly God has listened. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, because he has not rejected my prayer, or removed his steadfast love from me. Amen. Let's pray together. Go ahead and pray out loud with us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Why don't you guys stand up? We can worship with our bodies as well as our voices. Holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to Thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, Falling down before 
Amen. I love that even though we're singing in separate places, our voices are rising. And Christ is hearing the voice of his beautiful bride. Not just here, not just in your home, not even just in Korea, but all around the world. We are lifting our songs of praise to him. His love never fails, no matter what our circumstances. And that is why we sing this praise. Nothing. Nothing can separate. Even if I ran away, your love never fails. I know I still make mistakes, but you have new mercies for me every day. Your love never fails. You stay the same through the ages. Your love never changes. There may be pain in the night, but joy comes in the morning. And when the oceans rage, Because I know that you love me, your love never fails. The wind is strong and the water's deep. I'm not alone here on these open seas. Your love never fails. chasm is far too wide I never thought I'd reach the other side but your love never fails you stay the same through the ages your love never changes there may be pain in the night but joy comes in the morning and when the oceans rage I don't have to be afraid because I know that you love me your love never Sing this with faith. You made all things work together for my good. You made all things work together for my good. You made all things work together for my good. You make all things work together for my good. It's his promise to us. You make all things work together for my good. You make all things work together for my good. You say the same ages. Your love never changes. There may be pain in the night, but joy comes in the morning. And when the oceans rage, I don't have to be afraid, because I know that you love me. Your love never fails. Oh, you never fail. Your love never fails. Thank you, God. 
God, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your unfailing love. Guys, as we go into this next song, be thinking about the specific ways that God has been good to you this week, this month, just this past little while. Maybe a way that he's provided for you financially. Maybe just some unexpected encouragement or some good news. We want to hear those stories, and so later, after the bridge, we'll give you a chance to share those, those stories on chat. So be thinking as we sing. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me All my days have been held in your hand From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God Lift your voices and all my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice You have led me through the fire In darkest nights You are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend Here I have lived in the goodness of God And all my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Sing your goodness. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Come and hear, all you who fear God, and I will tell what he has done for my soul. Tell us what God has been doing for you. Go ahead and fill up that chat with praises, with stories. We want to hear from you. We need you to testify what God has been up to. You have been
God is alive. He is well by His Spirit. And He is on the move, bringing all things together for good. And you and I, we are seen and loved deeply by our Heavenly Father. We've missed seeing uh, each one of you in person, but for as long as we meet online, we wanted to start inviting community members to share how they're doing from home and what God is teaching them and showing them in this season. And we've also asked them to lead us in prayer. So together as a body, a community, we can be praying through the season. Bless you, church. We miss you and we love you. Hello, my name is Weldon Rice. In this season, it's been a season of challenge, uh, but also excitement, uh, as my wife and I expect uh, a baby this fall. And, you know, uh, during this time, uh, my experience with God has really been one of molding, where, where God has been, I've been sort of leaning into God more than I probably have in a while. And, um, you know, challenge sort of takes you off autopilot and, and puts your trust back where it belongs uh, in God. It humbles you, uh, and you know those sort of things are not easy to go through, but they're good things to go through. And so, God is continually leading me through that during this season. So, um, I love to pray for those who uh, who are facing challenges uh, during this time, uh, that they would draw near to God. Father, we just pray for those who are facing challenges, job loss, or um, anything else that they, they are facing right now, Lord. Um, we know that life is not certain, even during good times or prosperous times, uh, but challenging times such as this remind us of that, and uh, we pray that that would lead people, God, to press into you more, that it would humble them and to, and and that they would come humbly before you, knowing that they are held in your arms and that you are good and that you are not going to leave them uh, nor forsake them. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Hey, what's up everybody at King's Cross Church? Hi, my name is Evan. I've been asked just to share a little bit about my experience, you know, the last couple of weeks. And you know, with everything going around uh, in the world today with coronavirus, you know, one thing that I've been learning and been confronted with is what it means uh, to be alone and feelings of loneliness that a lot of us may have. You know, I'm here on this rooftop in Seoul and the first two weeks when I got back from the States, I spent a lot of time of my free time here on this roof alone. And you know, one of the things when all things are stripped away, you know, I realize that I'm really good at keeping myself busy with work or with social life or with things at school. But, you know, when all of those things are taken away and you have to spend a lot of time alone, then you're really confronted with something that I think a lot of us have deep inside of us. And that's feelings of loneliness. Whether you're single or with a family, I think all of us can relate at some point in our life. You know, one thing that God has been teaching me in this season is, uh, and He's been so gracious, is as I've been meditating on His Word, I was reminded this week of Matthew. Uh, chapter 28 at the end of the Great Commission Jesus promises something pretty amazing he says that you know that he promises that he will surely be with us to the very end of the age and you know for me just meditating on that this week has been so comforting knowing that Jesus in fact is with us you know how can we be sure that Jesus promises uh, to be with us well in fact that's what the gospel is that's the good news that you know Jesus was at the cross separated from the Father so that we would never have to be separated from Him again. You know, and that's my encouragement to you, church, this week. I want to challenge you guys, if you're going through any hardships in this season, to really hold on to the promises of God's Word and know that He is with you. Let me pray for us, church. Father, you know, I just thank you that, you know, even in this season, that we could be a church that loves one another, that we could pray together. That God, that when we're confronted with different things at the core of our heart, that we could apply the gospel and that we could look at the word and know that Jesus, your promises are true for us. So if anyone out there is right now struggling with loneliness or different types of hardships, Father, we pray and we thank you that Jesus has come and defeated all of that at the cross. Thank you that your promises are sure and true. Father, we pray for the world, we pray for Korea, we pray for the church, that God, that you will continue to be sovereign, and we trust that God, that you love and you are with us. 
Uh, thank you, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Thanks, church. Peace out. Amen. It's good seeing uh, some of the old familiar faces. Thank you guys for praying for us, <clears throat> praying with, uh, with us. Starting today, we're going to be looking at exploring a new book, a book of Daniel, for the next several weeks. I don't know what comes to your mind when you think about book of Daniel. Uh, for me, growing up in a pretty conservative church, I remember uh, in Sunday schools, a lot of amazing stories about Daniel and the lion's den, Daniel and the fire, and just awesome stories and making these weird crafts. Um, but those of you guys that grew up maybe in, in a little bit more charismatic churches, probably Daniel, uh, the book of Daniel was often about uh, talking about these crazy dreams and visions and unpacking what these dreams meant and the Antichrist, end times, and wild, wild stuff. Um, but for our time in the book, I just want us to take a fresh look at this biblical book. And really, at the heart of this story is a story about uh, Israelites who were taken as captives to a major world power at the time, Babylon. The Babylonians, or Babylon, was overtaking Egypt as the most powerful world power at the time. And as they were taking over Egypt, um, and they took over Jerusalem, uh, they didn't actually destroy Jerusalem, but rather they took resources. They took uh, young, smart, good-looking, capable men and carried them to Babylon. And they took resources from Jerusalem. And, and Daniel and his three friends uh, were part of that initial group that were forced from their homes, now finding, find themselves in a new city, learning the ways of Babylon. They've been captured, hauled off, living in a new city, new culture, new language. We know how that feels. Many of us living in Seoul, new rules. And basically, the author of the book, author of Daniel, tells their story of challenges, hardships, victories that they experience through unchanging faithfulness of God. So when you think about Babylon, Babylon was the world power. They were, like, they were the world power at the time, but it is also an archetype, archetype of human pride and rebellion against God. Babylon is actually the place where the Babylon was at the time, was the place of pa Tower of Babel. Remember Tower of Babel in Genesis 11? The tower we find in Genesis 7, if you know the story, this tower was built uh, because of this humanity's desire to be like God, to, to, to go to each sky, to be like God. If you read Genesis 11 to the story, it says they found a plain in the land of Shinar, which Babylon was at the time, and settled there. And this is the Tower of Babel story. And they said to one another, human beings at the, at the same time said to one another, verse 4, Genesis eleven four, 4, Come, let us build ourselves a city, a tower with its top in heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves. But we know the story. God, out of His grace and mercy, He knew only bad things could come out, so He did not allow that tower to remain. But Babylon, in the story of Daniel, it's in that exact place. It's the archetype of rebellion against God, human pride. And God has called Daniel and his friends to this new place as, as exiles, but also called to remain faithful in their new city. The call is to live in the world. The call for Daniel and his friends is to live in the world, but not become of it. And, and, you know, thousands of years later, these are the same challenges that you and I face every day as you go to work, go to school, in our homes, as we interact with our non-Christian friends and coworkers and bosses. This challenge to live in the world but not become of it has been part of our Christian history from the very beginning of the church, right? The tension of living in the world but not living, but living differently from it to be salt and light, to be city on a hill is a challenge that we have been living with from the very beginning. And through the story of Daniel and his friends, you know, God wants to show us once again what it means to really live in the city, not live above the city, not live away from the city, but to really engage the city, but to really live differently from it. Let's read Daniel chapter 1. We're going to go verses 1 to 21. 
We're going to read the whole chapter. Daniel chapter 1. We're going to go verse 1 to 21. Let me read for us. In the third year of the reign of Jehovah Kim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehovah Kim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar. Shinar is the place where Genesis 11 took place. To the house of his God and placed the vessels in the treasury of his, his God. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of nobility, youths without blemish, of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace, and to teach them the literature and the language of Chaldeans. The king assigned them a daily portion of food the king ate, and of the wine that he drank, they were to be educated for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. Among these were Daniel, Hanani, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of eunuch gave them names. Daniel he called Belshazzar, Hananiah he called Shadrach, Mishael he called Meshach, and Azariah he called Abednego. Abednego. Verse 8, but Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food, with the wine he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of eunuchs to allow him to not to defile himself. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who assigned your food and your drink, for why should he see you are in worse condition than the youths who are of your own age? So you would endanger my head with the king. Then Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, test your servants for ten days. Let us be given vegetables to eat, water to drink. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants according to what you see. So he listened to them. In this matter and tested them for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate king's food. So the steward took away their food and wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. Verse 17, as for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. At the end of the time when the king had commanded that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar and the king spoke with them and among all of them none was found like Daniel and Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah. Therefore they stood before the king and in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in all his kingdom. And Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. This is the word of God. So we're going to just walk through this story. But before we do that, here is the context, just for us to get us caught up to where we are in this story. King Jovakim took reign after uh, the death of King Josiah. Some of us know Josiah, who was actually a good God-fearing king after many, many terrible kings in the land of Judah. And Josiah, the king of God's people, during his reign had managed to turn things around for the people of the land, right? Under Josiah's leadership, there was a revival, a renewed desire to return to the Lord. It was amazing. Yet as soon as Josiah passes... God's people quickly reverted back to their old ways of living with idolatry and sin. So God brings judgment through the hands of Babylonians, through this king, Nebuchadnezzar. And as a result, Daniel and his friends now find themselves in a complete new city called Babylon. Uh, verses 1 and 2. So there's this interesting interplay between the actions of Nebuchadnezzar who was the most powerful man in the world, and God, who remains to be sovereign throughout this book, throughout this story. You see, King Nebuchadnezzar has taken control. At least he thinks he has. He has taken Jerusalem. He has taken vessels from the temple of God. 
His thinking, I am in total control. I'm the most powerful man in the world. Yet listen to the author in verse 2. The author reminds the audience, the Lord gave the king of Judah into his hand. See, on the surface, surface, everything seems to be driven by this king's ambition and hunger for power. Right? Yet the author says, don't forget, don't be fooled. Even the most powerful man at the time, he is merely a character in the story that God is writing out for his people. See, one thing we cannot miss from the very beginning of the story is this unchanging truth, and it's this. Nothing escapes the hand of God. Nothing escapes the hand of God. Everything we hear from verses 1 to 3 sounds terrible for Daniel and his friends and and God's people, right? God's city has been attacked. His temple has been robbed. Their most capable men have been taken into captives, yet author says, rest assured, Because this only happened because God gave them the king of Judah. See, Nebuchadnezzar thinks he's in charge. But the author says, no, it's not him. It's God and his plans will always come to fruition. In the same way, when we find ourselves in a difficult, hard, and painful place. Remember these words in verse 2. God gave God allowed. In fact, that phrase, God gave, shows up over and over again through chapter 1. That God interrupts and He is active in the story of His people. You see, nothing happens in the same way. Nothing happens in your life, in my life, that is out of God's mighty hand. Out of control of God's mighty hand. Even when we don't see it, when we don't feel it, when we don't believe it, God is still actively working things out for the greater purpose. So let me put it this way. Listen, if you feel like it's been a hard season, if you feel like it's been a trying season, for many of us it's been a hard season, listen, God is not lost. God is not surprised. God is not distraught. Nothing is happening in your life that is outside of God's plan for you and His purpose. He's got you. He's got your family. He's got your marriage. He's got your future. He is good. And we can trust Him even in the most difficult seasons of life. Amen? He's got you. But this doesn't mean we will never face hardships. This doesn't mean we will never face pushbacks, setbacks as we journey with Jesus. It doesn't mean also those experiences will not be painful. I wish I could tell you that they're not going to be painful. Once you sign up to be with Jesus, you're not going to experience any hardships or pushbacks and setbacks. But we know if you've walked with Jesus for any time now, you know hardships and pushbacks and setbacks are very painful. I mean, imagine Daniel and his friends. They were part of the royal family. I mean, they were the cream of the crop. They had a great future ahead of them. It wasn't like they were Joe Schmoes. They were capable, smart. They had they come from the right family, right education. Not only that, they were wholeheartedly committed to God. You get Daniel and his friends. They just stand up against the, the most powerful man. He says, I will not eat from your table. I mean, he, they were wholeheartedly committed to God. I mean, they had every, they'd done everything right, but just in a moment, everything is taken away. And they find themselves in a completely new culture as mere slaves. I mean, glorified slaves, but they are slaves. So again, as we walk with Jesus, there are going to be times and seasons where we're going to face hard things. Verse 3, and se- three to 7, So the king tells his main man, his chief official to go back and and bring back these young men who are smart good looking and capable who can work for his own kingdom and they were to be trained for three years i mean they took training very seriously three years to learn the ways of babylon learn their language learn their religion learn their culture and they were even given new names right they they wanted these men to become the best babylonian that they could become They were to drink and eat from king's table. And at the end of their training, they were going to be sent to different places to serve as representative of their new king. But verse 8, Daniel, it says, Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself. Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself. 
So hearing the instruction, hearing what they have to do now, Daniel makes a daring request to the chief official. But he asks if he and his friends can refrain from eating from the meat and the wine that came from king's table. Right? And he uses the word, I will not defile myself. Verse 8, the word is defile. And when you look at the word defile, the original language, it is talking about a religious commitment. Right? Define is I will, this is a religious term. So Daniel's request to, to, to be refrained from the food that was coming from the king's table has everything to do with his worship. Everything to do with his commitment to God. It wasn't like Daniel was a vegetarian. He's like, I don't want the meat. No, it has everything to do with worship. It was a matter of worship unto Yahweh, his God. Because the Babylonians sacrificed their meat in their own temples, their own gods, right? It was a form of worship. And we also know the Babylonians ate all types of meat, whereas Israelites had strict rules for what was clean, what was unclean, what, what was allowed to be eaten, and what was not. So Daniel says, give us vegetables and water. A dangerous request. Again, they aren't simply asking for a menu change or complaining about the food. No, they are taking a stand against the king and the gods of Babylon. And the chief official immediately rejects. I mean, the, the scripture says the, the, this chief official really liked Daniel and his friends, right? Ha, liked them, favored them, but he immediately says no to their request because if the word got out, if the king found out that they were refusing to eat his food and drink his wine, it would have been seen as act of treason. So he says, no. I mean, I like you. I like you guys, but no, can't do that. Yet Daniel will not take no for an answer. Look at verse 11. After being rejected by the main guy, he now turns to the guard. There's another guy who's watching over them. Right? In verse 12, he's like, he's got a plan. He's like, test your servants for 10 days. Okay, not for three years. Give us 10 days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. And verse 14, the guard, the official says no, but the guard says, okay, let's try for 10 days. Right? I get to eat your meat. It's for 10 days. If it doesn't work out, we'll go back. And Daniel and his friends... Again, put everything on the line to remain faithful to Yahweh, to remain faithful to God. Remember, everything they do, right? They're in this training school, right? They have been removed from their home. And everything they do is being evaluated by this chief official, right? Everything is a test, test to prove themselves to be the best Babylonian, right? They're, they're, they're to fall in line and become the best Babylonian out of the pack. If they do well, they can still live comfortably and make a name for themselves in this new land. I mean, they still have a chance. They're slaves and they're, they're exiles, but they still have a chance to do great things. Yet here in verse 8, Daniel and his friends risk everything to remain faithful to Yahweh. That's some kind of courage, Verse 15 and 17, so God blesses Daniel in response. God blesses Daniel and his friends for their faithfulness, for their commitment. And at the end of 10 days, they are stronger, healthier, fatter than all other men who was eating from the king's table. In verse 17, the author adds, God gave them learning, skill in all literature, wisdom. And for Daniel, God gave him understanding in all visions and dreams. And verse 18 tells us at the end of their training, after three years of training, three years of being committed to God, the king, during his evaluation time, took notice. And it says Daniel and his friends were ten times better than all of his magicians and enchanters. I mean, what a story. What a beginning of an amazing story. What a story of great courage and faithfulness. Yet if we're really honest, this isn't often a picture of our own lives. Because faith is not easy. What Daniel and his friends did to great courage and faith, and, and faith is hard. Fear is easy. Doubt is easy. Compromising is easy. But faith is difficult. 
As we read through this story, I wish I can say I am like Daniel. I wish I can say I'm always ready to move in faith even in the most difficult seasons of life. I mean, don't you wish you can say that? Don't you wish you can say, I always choose to honor God even if that means I may take a loss? Truth is, at least for me, I don't know about you, maybe you're there, but not for me. That's not how, how I often respond in real life. Often I am not like Daniel. In fact, if anything, I am more like the other Israelites who did not have the courage to stand against the king. And the, so the lesson of the story, I believe the lesson of the story is not that we have to be like Daniel because even if you tried really hard, we really can't. In fact, the lesson of the story, I believe, is the courage and the victory we have in life. Any victory, any courage that we have in life, they do not come from within, but it comes from the greater Daniel, Jesus Christ. You see, the danger of studying the book of Daniel is that we make Daniel the hero. And we tell ourselves, we have to be like Daniel. We have to get in the, the fire, the furnace. We have to get in, get in the cage with the lions. And we have to come out victorious. But you know what? You know and I know we are not like Daniel. We can pretend like we're Daniel. We can talk like we're Daniel. But truth is, we can't be Daniel without the greater Daniel, Jesus Christ. This is why we need Jesus, the greater Daniel. This is why Jesus is the greater Daniel that came to rescue you and I. Daniel in our passage is pointing us to Jesus Christ. Last week, Pastor John spoke about these men who were on the road to Emmaus. And Jesus shows up after being risen. And he opens scripture and he tells these men that everything, all the prophets and stories in the Old Testament is actually speaking about me. And I believe through Daniel's story, the, the lesson is not, oh, we have to be like Daniel. But it's actually what Daniel, who Daniel is, is showing us our champion, Jesus Christ. Look at how Daniel is pointing us to Jesus. You see, God sent Daniel from the promised land to Babylon, a broken and sinful place. God sent his son Jesus, the greater Daniel, from his throne, from his riches, into the world that is utterly sinful and broken. Daniel was obedient and he did not defile himself. Jesus was obedient and became sin for us. You see, Daniel's obedient prevented him from becoming a defilement. But Jesus is obedient because he did it for us. He became defiled. It's through Daniel's faithfulness his people were rescued from the hands of their enemies. And it's through Jesus' faithfulness you and I, who were his enemies, now have been rescued and invited in. So as we read through this amazing story of Daniel and his friends, I hope... We're not discouraged, like, oh, we can't be Daniel. The reality is we can't. But it's through Jesus, the true Daniel, we have courage, we have victory, and we have life that we did not have. And I think that's really the lesson of Daniel 1. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this amazing story. And Lord, we, it's our confession uh, we're not like Daniel. We're more like the other Israelite men who could not stand against the king. But Jesus, you came knowing that we we're afraid and we could not stand. We had no courage. You came for us because of us. You lived a life that we could not live. And you died the death that we deserved. And now... Lord, because of what you have done, we have courage. Now, because of what you have done, we can actually stand against even the greatest evil. So, Lord, help us, God, to continue to soak ourselves in the reality of who you are. Strengthen us once again. We thank you for this amazing story. Just in we pray. Amen. At this time, um, I want to invite you guys, um, as we go into time of communion, um, people in this room, 
we're going to try things a little differently. Um, as you're getting your elements ready, let me just remind you what this is, right? Every week, even as we gather virtually, uh, we wanted to do communion uh, because really this is the highlight of what we do every week because we are not Daniel. Because if we heard Daniel, we didn't need his body and his blood, but because we could not do it, Jesus came, and again, Jesus gave us the victory. And as we gather as church community online, together in this room, what we're doing is we're actually celebrating the victory that Jesus has won on that cross. So Jesus, on the night he was taken, he, was, he gave himself up to be crucified. He invited his friends, and he reminded them, hey, the victory you have is not in you. It's actually in what I'm about to do. And he took out bread. And he said, this is actually my body that's been given for you. Whenever you gather, take this bread in remembrance of me. So that's what we'll do right now. This is Jesus' body. Let's take it together. At the same time, Jesus took out a glass of wine and he said, this is my blood that's been poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. I got a big piece of bread, so I'm sorry. I got you. Hold on. Wine. And he said, this is what makes you clean. This is what qualifies you. This is what allows you to actually come in. It's not your, your good life. It's not... Your sinless life, it's none of that. It's actually my blood poured out for you. Do this also. It remembers me. Let's take this together as well. I want to invite the worship team. Um, and let's respond um, as we think about not just this story, but what Jesus has done for us. Thank God for his unbroken love. Thank God that he sent us a better Daniel. And because Jesus was faithful, we will never be unloved. Even when we fail, like the song says, even when we run away, we will always be pursued by this God who loves us beyond all reason, beyond anything we have experienced else on this earth. I mean, this kind of love is, God is the only person giving this kind of love and he will continue to love us in this way because it's who he is.
deep I'm not alone here on these open seas Your love never fails The chasm is far too wide I never thought I'd reach the other side But your love never fails Cause I know that you love me Your love never fails You make all things work together for my good Cause I know that you love me Your love never fails Your love never So, yeah, great time of worship, right, King's Cross? <laughs> uh, so as we go into the next part of our worship, um, we'll share a little announcements. So first, um, you know, giving, is, offering is part of our worship. And so we have um, our slide here that shows you how uh, you can give and uh, your tithe to King's Cross. Um, as we continue to be virtual, um, our community groups are the same way. So you can join our online groups. We've got them all listed right here with times. If you are interested in joining uh, this, uh, one of these groups, please go to our website linked below uh, for more information. Uh, we will continue to have online prayer meetings Thursdays at 8 p.m. on Instagram Live. So please come if you would like to pray together as a group um, or if you have any requests for the church to pray for you. And then finally, uh, as we had communion today, um, we would like for you all to continue to join us every week uh, virtually and prepare your own um, communion. So... Uh, very simply, just any anything that's in the home, whether it's bread, uh, juice, uh, just make it simple. Um, the act of it is more important than the, yeah. Thank you. Guys, will you stand with us as we sing the doxology? Mm -hmm. 
praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Here is the benediction from Ephesians chapter 3. May Christ dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. May this reminder go with us now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you guys for joining us. Uh, we're going to leave the chat a little bit uh, open a little bit longer. Please hang out, share, connect. Uh, we, we love uh, being part of your Sunday. Continue to log in. See you guys uh, very soon. Bye, guys.